John chapter 5 and verse 11. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. And just for a brief time, I'm going to talk to us from this subject, Redeeming the Unworthy. Redeeming the Unworthy. And let us just ask God maybe just to touch our hearts and to incline our ears to the word of the Lord that we will hear today that it may effect some good. Dear Father, we one more time lift our eyes to the heavens from whence comes our help, Lord. And we are so much indebted to you, but we thank you for your providence and we thank you for your love and kindness. Lord, you have been mindful of us from the very early existence in life, even unto this time. And we are very grateful that you do all of these things, and yet you superintend the very universe. And so, Lord, well, you thought upon us, amen, to bring us out of darkness into marvelous light. We are forever eternally grateful. We trust that your hand will continue to be upon us, Lord, and to help us. And Lord, we pray for our broken city, a city that is steeped in sin and unrighteousness. But God, we know that thou art able to help us and to bring us to the place, Lord, where we ought to be. I pray that your hand would be heavy upon us, Lord, to keep us and to direct us and to strengthen us and to engage us in the kingdom work. I pray that you will ever strengthen our hearts, Lord, and amen, guide our step and strengthen the knees that are feeble. And Lord, I pray that you may reach to those that are lost and those that are in the highways and hedges of our world, and that you'll bring them into the banqueting house where there is, there is guidance and there's protection and there is love. God, I pray that you would help us today. And Lord, there are many they may be in this congregation, Lord, that the only hope they ever have of being well, of ever being amen, sober, of ever being purposeful in their life, it has to come from you. So Lord, I pray that you will reach for them and speak to them, Lord, specifically, as only you could do. Lord, we take absolute authority over this place and we bind everything that is unlike you casting it down and, and not forbid and not allowing it to operate and then lord we release ap ap absolute power and authority and dominion apostolic authority over this place oh god and i pray that you'll give us the harvest oh lord in the time as we see the day approaching when you shall come Lord Jesus, we're mindful of the loss today, and I pray that you'll help us, that may reach them before that day. Hear thou from heaven, and touch the lips of clay, I pray, in Jesus' name, and all the people say, amen. God bless you, and please be seated. Redeeming the unworthy. I wish to call your attention to the fact that we are we are obligated to minister to humanity's hurting and helpless creatures to Adam's falling race in as much as their own action and conduct have brought them to where they are today. Nevertheless, we are still indebted to this generation. Our gospel embraces a concept that man is a fallen, eternally doomed to a devil's hell outside of the grace of God. We learn a valuable lesson that mankind is really fallen. 
and fallen at the hand of another, and we have been wounded on both of our feet so that we're not able to walk. We're not able to say, sustain ourselves outside of God's help. And we have a responsibility of forgiving, of standing in place of those that are lost, those that are guilty, and to endeavor to rescue the perishing. We cannot only minister or should not attempt only to minister to those that we feel are deserving or those whom we feel are good. But if you notice in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, the apostle says, For Christ also had once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And so Christ is the just one, and we are the unjust. But the Lord suffered for us so that he might bring us to God. So we should always remember, regardless of how long we have been saved and regardless of how we've had some spiritual experiences, that we at one time stood in need of God and of need of God's grace. And we have really experienced the mercy of God and the kindness of God ourselves because we were at some time estranged from God. And so we must be willing also to show mercy to those that are, seem to be unloved and, and really are in some terrible and deplorable condition because at one time we used to travel that same road. The apostle says such were some of us. So we weren't born righteous. We were not... We were not born with the Holy Ghost, but at some times we were estranged from God, but the loving hand of God reached to where we are. One songwriter said, he said that it was the loving hand of God that reached down to us and really pulled us out of the awful miry clay. David also said that he brought me up also out of an horrible pit, the pit of despair. And so we are, we are enjoying a wonderful salvation now, but if we reflect back and are honest with ourselves, it was God that came along and really helped us from where we were. So we too were unworthy, but we're redeemed by the grace of God. And so this morning I want you to allow me just to point out three things from the setting of our text. Firstly, Sin has an awful effect upon its victims. The setting of our text this morning is in the city of Jerusalem, probably during the time of a Passover observance. And our Lord is in this pitiful place. He goes to this place that is really filled with just a lot of sick people. Adam's falling race, and it, it's such, an, uh, it's such a, uh, a statement that we've got so many needs. We just, we just are needy people, regardless of, of our standing in life. There, there are many of us who have a lot of the wherewithals, but yet we're just needy people, all kinds of needs. Um, as I walk through the streets and I look at our at our city and our people, just people just need, have a lot of need. And some need maybe the government can make, maybe your friends can meet, maybe some benevolent group can try and reach. But there are just some need that only God can minister to, only, only God can really help. Because we have a, such a, a high level of need. It is quite interesting when we picture this setting here that John brings before our mind in verse 2 of, of chapter 5 we're told it is by the sheep gate 
And the sheep gate, we, we, we read about it in a couple places, probably three places in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 1. It tells us about the sheep gate. And the, the, the thing that struck my mind right away is that this gate actually points to Jesus and the cross. The sheep gate in the Jewish sense is used to bring in the sacrificial animals. It was through this particular gate because if you read through Nehemiah, there are several gates, but the, the sheep gate was the gate through which the sacrificial animals were brought into the, the temple area. And only in Jesus Christ, the guilty sinner can for, find mercy. And so Jesus now comes into this place and really it is a fulfillment. He is really a fulfillment of this place. Earlier, John had told us a very, very, very interesting thing he made in John chapter 1 and verse 29 when he saw Jesus coming to him to be baptized. He says, Behold the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. So Jesus is here pictured then as the fulfillment of all the sacrificial services and feasts that had taken place. And, and many times the Lord is in the place and people are unaware who is really there. And it's also of interest that John tells us that there were five porches. Now, in biblical setting, numbers are quite significant. The number five has to do with God's favor and God's grace, and it speaks to us of salvation. So there were at least five places that God is going to reach to people if they are aware of who is really in the house. So Jesus now comes to this scene of almost helpless people, and people are there just waiting for the troubling of the water. Now, this is a seasonal thing. This is not something that they could, they could partake of every day. This is just a certain season. And the needs were so, so high. The need was so, so really um, painful, if you think about it, that people just sat there hoping that this water would be troubled so that they could then going to this pool. And so when we contemplate Bethesda, it is first a picture of sinful Israel. We look at Bethesda and we, we see in it Israel. Israel is impotent. Israel is blind. They're halting. They're withered. And they're waiting. Just sitting around waiting presumably they're waiting for their messiah but it's quite ironic that the messiah shows up jesus shows up and really they are oblivious to the lord he shows up he's on the scene they, they're really waiting for him and when he does come they're so blind they can't see they're totally ignorant of Jesus because here was a man who could meet every single need that was exhibited at this pool. Every need that humanity had, Jesus was, was able to minister and to speak to that need. So Bethesda then was a picture of Israel and its need. Secondly though, Bethesda is a picture of the world, a world that is blighted by sin, and much of it is caused by sinful lifestyle. They're blind, they can't see. They're lame, they can't walk, withered, can't move. They're deformed, they're paralyzed. Sin is a, is a terrible, is a terrible, terrible tyrant in the lives of people. When we look at our world today, our world, regardless of what country it is, 
whatever the standing they are, how rich they are, the blight of sin is pervasive. And it, ra it has ravaged Adam's falling race. We have upward of 7 billion people on this planet, but sin goes to the depths of every society, every strata. It touches every human that walk on the face of this globe. So ravenous, so deep-seated is sin that it has blinded the entire human race. The only remedy, the only solution is the man Christ Jesus. Regardless of what people are going to tell you, that we're going to worship at. The only solution, the only remedy, the only prescription that is able to minister to the needs of mankind has to come from our Lord. And it's such a, it is such a wonderful thing that we can be in a place like this and understand that we have been to Jesus. We have been to the place. We have been ministered to. We have been healed. We have been set free by the grace of God in the sea of humanity that has been, as it were, torn up by sin. We have been healed. One songwriter said, Jesus came along and he lifted me from my load of sin. And now I'm free and hallelujah because he has lifted us. He has lifted us not because we were great, not because we were so holy, but he lifted us out of his kindness. He lifted us because he had a great heart that beat in him that showed the condition and that compassion that he showed, friend, was what caused us to be here today. Bethesda is a picture of just desperate humanity grasping for a cure to its ill. Humanity is desperately ill with all kinds of diverse maladies and cancer and tumors and Affliction, we, we sometimes, we, we don't even know the depths of some diseases that has ravished the human body and the mind. The prognosis is not good. But songwriter says, I know a found where sins are washed away. Burdens are lifted, blind eyes made to see. There is one work in power in the blood of Calvary and only a prescription from the great physician that can really address itself to our ailment. Our world has been pronounced guilty by the word of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 the apostle says that for all have sinned and come short or miss the mark if you will come short of the glory of God. All have sinned doesn't matter your culture, doesn't matter your, your, what your color, your skin is, doesn't matter what your education was, irrelevant of your bank account, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have missed the mark of his holiness. But there is hope. There is hope for the look of the crucified one. And hope came on the scene at that place called Bethesda. And God was willing, God was ready, God was able to redeem mankind. If only he would realize the day of his visitation. Because sometimes God will show up. But if we're not cognizant of his presence, he'll be there. But we won't recognize him as these people at Bethesda. He, here was the Lord came there on the Passover, of which he was really the representation of that Passover. He was the fulfillment of that rep representation. But people were still doing what they used to do. They were still going about their business. Here was the Lord of glory. God wrapped in a robe of flesh in amongst them. Had all the power. Here was the great physician. Hallelujah. The great physician was there, but people were still gathered around that pool. That pool could only help one person, and that probably once a year. And here was the great physician that, was, that had power to heal, power to save, power to deliver, power to set free, and 
people are still wrapped around that pool. And yet there was a greater than that pool was there. And that, if I might say so, all of them could have been healed. Every one of them could have been healed. And we see that Jesus has come, offered us life. But you look at our religious world today. They're still steeped in all of their traditions. You go to India, they're still worshiping that Ganges River. They won't kill the cows. What are they doing? Jesus is here. Jesus showed up. The Shintoists are still looking at their, their previous generation and worshiping spirit and, and giving heed to all kinds of things. People are looking to Mohammed and Jesus is here. They're just still doing all that they've been doing, but yet the great physician, Jeremiah says, is there a bomb in Gilead? And the resounding, yes, there is a bomb in Gilead. Can they be healed? Yes, he can be healed because there is healing balm. And people just have to know that Jesus is on the scene. Jesus is here. We don't have to be worshiping the river. A greater than the river is here. Amen. We don't have to be worshiping cows. A greater than cow is here. Amen. We don't have to be standing at the, at the pool there waiting for the angel to trouble the water because a greater than angel is here. Hallelujah. Oh, my friend, there is Jesus is here. And if Jesus is here, there is an opportunity to get healed. Man, there's an opportunity to get all of our blight looked at. There is an opportunity to come to the, Je to the Jesus that we know about and get our minds fixed, clothed in our right mind. We don't have to wander among the tombs anymore. We don't have to be wandering in the, in the desert places anymore. We can come home. Hallelujah. But sin has, has such a, a wide range blight that it destroyed the very fabric of humanity. Secondly, Jesus chose the worst case at this pool. Didn't heal all of them, but he come and he, he's focused on one particular man, victim of paralysis. And then we also later learn that he was also a first class sinner. And Luke and John lets us know that. But though this man was unworthy, having an unattracted character, but Jesus yet focused on him. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus, that's where he went. I believe he went to the worst case, which implies. That if he's able to minister to this worst case, then you are a candidate for healing if you will come. You are a candidate for Jesus' work if you would come. If Jesus can fix his mess, if Jesus can heal his paralysis, if Jesus can forgive his sin, then certainly Jesus can help you. In verse 14, of John chapter 5, Jesus tells him quite blankly, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon thee. So that implies then that it's through his sinful lifestyle, his indulgences, his excess, that had brought about this pathetic condition that he was now in. But, he, but yet Jesus sought to make him whole. Which lets us know that there is always hope. Hallelujah. Amen. There is, there is always hope. You know, because some people might, might have said with some uh, justification, well, he's simply reaping what he has sown. I know how he's been. A sinner like that. I know what he used to do. And so now he's sick, can't move. Well, he's getting his just dessert. But, but Jesus didn't go that way. Hallelujah. The Bible said he didn't come to condemn us. He, we were already condemned. But he came to bring us from where we were. Hallelujah. He didn't come to point the finger, friend. Man, that finger was already pointed at us. But God saw the plight of humanity. And so he didn't give us what we deserve. Thank God. Thank God he didn't give us what we deserve. 
But one songwriter said he looked beyond my faults. If, 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 if Jesus was going to look at our faults, none of us in this room could, could say anything. But he looked beyond our faults, saw my need. So the need, the need was there and God knew that the problem that we had, our, our proclivity towards doing wrong things, our, our, our tendency to do wrong things is always there. But he's going to go beyond that because many times God has to look at the product down the road. He can't really just look at the product here. If he just looked at how we are here, he would have ran. But he knows. Jesus knows that if he can get to work on us, Jesus knows if he, we would just allow him to work on us, he's going to bring something good out of our lives. If you notice in Psalms 130, verses 3 and 4, the psalmist says, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who, could, who, should, who shall stand? Who should stand if God should start marking iniquities? Not one of us would stand. Even though some of us would style ourselves that we're righteous. That we weren't such a bad sinner. That we were a good sinner. But yet we wouldn't stand. Because God is absolutely holy and absolutely perfect. So whatever measure we're going to use, we're going to still fall short of the glory of God. But, but the psalmist says, but there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be fair. When God forgive us, if we're right about it, we're going to love him. And the more God forgives us is the more we're going to love him if we are right. So there's mercy with God. And that is why as people of God, we have to look beyond the faults of those that we're ministering to. Do they look good? Probably not. Do they smell good? Maybe not. But we got to love them with the love of the Lord. Hallelujah. Because one day they will look all right. One day they will smell all right. Because the grace of God is going to go beyond all of that sinful lifestyle. And just like God extricated us from sin, God will bring them out of sin also. God will wash them. They may be homosexual today, but God can deliver them. They may be liars today, but God can set them free. Fornicators, but God can help them. Paul said such were some of us. Such were some of us, but we're washed. We're sanctified. We've been set free by the grace of God. And so we're going to love them. As we go out, some of the men, young men, young women, have gone out into the streets. And many of them, sometimes they send me back some pictures of what they're experiencing in the, in the street. And the people they're meeting. These are people that have broken. They're, they're sick. They're hurting. And they need a God. They just don't need Bethesda's water. But they need a God that has a healing water. The word of God said there would be a fountain open in the house of David. We need to point them to that fountain that's been opened. Where there's healing. Where there's deliverance. Where there's hope. In Luke chapter 14 verse 23 Jesus encourages his, the servant under this metaphor. The Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways. Are we going to risk ourselves? Probably. And into the hedges and compel them to come. See, this, this thing here, I believe sometimes, when we go to these places where we find some of these unsaved, there's many times they're going to have excuses as to why they would not come into the house of the Lord. Some are going to tell you, well, I don't have clothes. All I have is this kind of clothes. Well, you can come as you are because we know you're not going to stay like that when you come. Hallelujah. So compel them to come. Take away all of that false reasoning. Tell them to come to the house of the Lord. When they come, God will give them a new set of clothes. Hallelujah. Give them a new robe. Put something on their finger. Let them know they belong also in the house of God. 
One songwriter said, rescue the perishing, care for the dial. Tell them that Jesus is mighty to save. Tell them somebody said, weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen. Let them know that Jesus is still able. The sin is scarlet, says Isaiah. God will make them white as snow. Amen. God will take his red blood, put you through there, and you come out white. Amen. There is a transformation that takes place. And so we can do that regardless of the, how they got in their condition, you know, because sometimes we can say, well, you know why you, 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 you're in that position. You knew what that crack would do to you. Sometimes we're not smart. But we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We, we want them to recover from that mess. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're not going to let them stay that way. We're going to tell them that there is somebody that can touch your life and take that crack addiction out of your bloodstream. Take it out. Get you straightened up. Let you become profitable now. Because the way you are, you're not profitable to anybody. You're not even good to yourself nor to your family. I've known a young men that got caught up in that kind of a lifestyle and he almost sold everything they had. If it was left up to him, he would have sold his grandmother also. Just to get a fix. So we know God that is able to help them out of there. So sometimes we got to be compassionate Ezekiel said I sat where they sat and Ezekiel had been prophesying for several chapters and he, when he sat where they sat the Bible said he was astonished he was he was just completely overwhelmed as to the depravity as to where sin can bring people but only God can lift them out of that God sees our deplorable condition. Sometimes we're just seeing a part of it. Can you understand then the God who knows everything about their lives? They may only share a little bit with you, but God knows everything. But yet God still is there. And he's there to help. He's there to rescue. And so regardless of how they got into their suffering and into their situation, we still got to minister to them. No one can ever help them if we don't help them. No one is going to lift them up if we don't do it. They're doomed. This particular man, the Bible said he'd have been sick for 38 years. So sometimes we were sick for a few years and we get tired of our situation. At least this guy was still hanging around. 38 years in Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 14. This is how long Israel went in the wilderness. Just walking around with no purpose. Sometimes people's life has, 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 it were, has no purpose. They just, they just exist from day to day. But I want to tell you that if you allow God to intervene, to step into your life, you will start to recognize that your life will get some purpose to it, get some direction to it. You will see the probability of your, if your life. There's a reason. But until you get purpose, dear friend, you'll feel like there's no hope. Regardless of how long you've been in your situation, maybe not 38 years, but ever how long, your condition is not lost. Hope is not lost. But Jesus issues this challenge. Will thou be made whole? And you say, well, Lord, why are you asking him that question now? Will thou be made whole? Will thou be made whole? We, we, can't, we can't just take it for granted that people want to be made whole because some people are in some situation and they want to hold that just like a crutch. They just use it to elicit maybe sympathy. Will thou be made whole? Do you want to get out of that mess? Do you want to quit hanging around this place? Do you want to throw off those beggars' clothes? Do you want to get something now in your life that means, will thou be made whole? And then this question also, 
let him focus on his hopelessness without Christ. Without Christ. Will thou be made whole? It's going to force him to look at himself now. And I believe this man here probably was surprised by the question. But I think after a while, I think his heart perked up. May I suggest to you today that if you, if you have been in a, in a situation a long time, that Jesus is in the house. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus is in the house. And so there's hope. Thirdly, we must respond to Jesus' beckon to his overtures, regardless of how unworthy we may feel. We may feel that we're undeserving. Well, none of us are really deserving when you come to think of it. You may feel there's no hope, but I rise to tell you there is hope. I rise to let you know that there is hope. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, the Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door, and I'm knocking. If any man, there's no qualification. If any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, hear my voice and open the door, so the key there is that you've got to open that door. He's not going to kick that door down. I will come in. We've got a promise that if we will open our heart's door, then the Lord will come in. You don't have to be sitting around waiting for something to happen. You can make something happen by opening your heart and says, Lord, I am inviting you to come in. And I observed that Jesus didn't ask this man to, to commit to anything in particular until later. I mean, the man didn't have to know anything. He didn't have to be a Bible scholar. He didn't have to know about the typical significance of the hour. He didn't have to know about Mosaic law. He simply had a need. And Jesus says, I can meet that need. Do you want to be whole? To be made whole. And so you don't have to know anything. You don't have to be smart. Hallelujah. When, when you hear about the Holy Ghost, you don't even have to know where the Holy Ghost comes from. You don't have to know. You don't know how, anything. You just have to say, yeah, I need the Holy Ghost. I want that Holy Ghost. I, wa I, wanna, I don't want to be sitting around here all the time. Friend, if you have a need, Jesus can meet your need today. Jesus is in this place. Jesus can heal you of any infirmities you have. He will forgive your iniquities, wash your sins away. One songwriter said, I came to Jesus just as I was weary and sick with sin, but I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. You can come to the foot of the cross with all your sins. All your baggage, all your hurts, all of your the things, all of your mind is. And you can come and you can look at that crucified one. Jesus said if as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness and all they had to do was look and live. They were bitten by serpent, but all they had to do was look and live. You just have to come and look at, come to your, in your mind's eye, come to that foot of the cross and tell him out of your bondage, sorrow night, I'm coming, I'm sick, I'm weak, I'm infirm. I've got all kind of complaints I've got all kind of troubles I've got all kind of sicknesses but Jesus is powerful enough he's strong enough he's a healer he's a physician God can determine God can change your life this is what we got to tell them that there is there is life they don't have to be filled with despair but there's hope hallelujah and I heard one, one bishop were telling us many years ago that he, he, when he preached that message and that man looked within himself, he said, he asked that bishop, you, you mean there's hope for me? Yes, friend, there's hope for you. Hallelujah. You may, you may have sunk to the lowest depths of sin, but when you come to Jesus... When you come to that cross, it mean, doesn't matter how low you have gone, doesn't matter how many sins you have done, no matter how reprehensible you have committed some reprehensible crime, but God, oh Lord have mercy. Psalms 103, verses 3 and 4.
said so we should not forget the God that we're talking about, who forgiveth all our thine iniquities and who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and with tender mercies. All of that is present in the man Christ Jesus. I want you to notice carefully in, in 1 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 2. David had gone to this cave. And the Bible said now, and everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone was discontented, gathered themselves unto him. David is a type of Jesus. So regardless of how, how much distress you're facing, regardless of how indebted you are, regardless of how discontented you are with your life, Jesus is a place where you can resort to. If you've got debt, he's got riches. If you're discontented, he can give you joy. Amen. If, if, if you are in distress, God can relieve that stress and give you peace by the way of his cross. Hallelujah. Jesus can make that harlot chase again. Jesus can take that thief and make him honest again. He can take that man that can't tell a lie, stand in a stack of Bible, can tell that man and make him be truthful. Jesus is able to take the man that is all out of sin, in sin. He can make him good again. Why? Because there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is, a, that is a powerful cleansing agent, the blood of Jesus. Does more job what than, than what Ajax can do. Tide can do it, but the blood of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Paul said, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We got to know. We got to let them know that sin abounded in your life, but God's grace. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 19, Jesus makes a supreme announcement. He said, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I am glad that Jesus came where I was. I was wounded, amen, bound for hell. But that night, friend, hallelujah, amen, I got baptized in water in the name of Jesus. And he filled me with the Holy Ghost. He gave me purpose. Amen. Jesus announced in John chapter 10 and verse 10. He said, the devil come not but to kill. He meant to steal and to kill and to destroy. But he says, I am come that they might have life and that more abundantly. God can give you life. Furthermore, he can give you abundant life. Why? Because there is peace through the blood of his cross. He can wash you in his blood. Hallelujah. The blood that stained that old rugged cross. And he can give you peace. He he can heal you if you're lame Jesus can make you walk him and crippled God can heal that body mind that has been blown by all kind of stuff there is healing you can stand I'm done there is healing that's available and thank God there is healing hallelujah one songwriter said, the great physician now is here, the sympathizing Jesus. Great physician, great physician, hallelujah. Every one of you that's here, God can give you a prescription today that when you leave this place, you're going to be healed, going to be set free. You're going to be free to serve God. The Lord met the man a little later in the temple. Amen. When, when, when you get this healing, friend, 
you're going to want to stay close to Jesus. You're going to want to stay close to him. You, you're going to want to serve him. The healing goes so far. It is so deep seated. You're never going to be the same again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Never going to be the same again. I want you to pull up, pull up that song 170 for me. If you from sin are longing to be free, I want you to look to the Lamb of God. He to redeem you died on Calvary. Look to the Lamb of God. And then the chorus, look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God, for he alone is able to save you. Look to the Lamb of God.